Yeah. All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, February edition of the uh, Ottawa Center meeting. Uh, thanks for coming. I know it's uh, not a brutally cold night, but it still is uh, cold and I guess a bit, bit of snow. Um, uh, we've got a couple of announcements and a couple of changes to the uh, to the uh, to the meeting tonight. So let's go right to the next slide, please. Okay, on the agenda, what we have tonight, we have um, uh, Gordon Webster who's going to talk about uh, the flow. As I mentioned, uh, he's uh, going to give an update. Recall last time that uh, uh, we talked about a tour of the uh, Fred Lossing Observatory, the you know, Ottawa Centre's Observatory for members. We now have 37 people that have signed up for the tour. Um, um, Gordon is uh, working with uh, Ronte Martin to. Uh, um, to, 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 to organize that, and he'll, he'll talk about that as well, and in trim, also with the, uh, the plans for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the year ahead, and, and an area where we could use some help. Um, as well, we have um, Karen Finstad, she's our new uh, Astronauts editor. She's gonna talk about uh, Astronauts, and, um, I, she, and um, okay, we're getting, uh, looking like it's coming along, perfect. And, and follow that, we're going to have uh, uh, Al Scott. He's going to give his uh, usual 10-minute astronomy uh, news segment. No, no Ottawa skies this month. That'll resume next month. Uh, we have one change in the in the agenda tonight, and that's um, that's uh, Ryan Anderson. Uh, he, he's got uh, a bit of an emergency, so we're, um, we're going to put him to a to the next month. Um, so we're going to instead what we're going to do is instead of having Carmen after the break, we're going to Carmen. We're going to bring you um, and uh, your fascinating presentation, and you can take as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the good thing is that we're not going to be rushed tonight. So we can have lots of interaction with the observer reports uh, after the uh, after the break, and and um, and uh, it'll be a relaxed uh, relaxed me that's for sure. No, no time rush. So next slide, please. Okay, uh, I always like this, uh, this this portion of the meeting. It's uh, a couple of new members. Uh, Richard is as, as, as a member. David Lassa, Graham, Eric, Jane, Brian, and, and Bruce. So we're off to a good start in, in January. So th thanks for thanks for joining. And uh, and uh, we have um, membership cards that are available from uh, Al Fraser. Okay, so thank you for those and welcome. Next slide. So members in the news, a couple of things here, uh, which are interesting. By the way, as I said in my email to uh, um, the members here, you're going to notice tonight that we've uh, we've been after the uh, we've always had a few challenges in this uh, in this uh, in this venue here. It's uh, after the last meeting, we, we uh, uh, Bob and myself and uh, and uh, Chris we uh, hung around quite late to try and figure out what, what's what's going on for a resolution. So we beefed it up quite a bit. We think we've, we 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 we've, we've I cross your fingers and we've we've figured it out tonight. So I think you're going to see some impressive uh, astro images. Uh, members of the news, uh, Rob Dick was recognized for his uh, long service and his uh, contributions, particularly in, the, in light pollution abatement, as he's now recognized as a fellow of our of the uh, Royal Astronomical Society Canada. Rob, are you here? I didn't see you. Yep. Rob, congratulations. Well done. <laughs> All right, next slide. So something else here, Bob, uh, Bob Hiller here, our fellow manning our, manning our, uh, um, our, uh, our PowerPoint presentation tonight. You remember a couple of months ago, Bob gave a, um, he shared with us the, uh, the, the TELUS video that was created uh, on the, on the uh, construction of his, um, his uh, observatory, the remote observatory. It's about 100 kilometers from here. Uh, well, remember how, how charming that, uh, that, that video was? Well, it, it was shared at the uh, Cannes um, uh, Festival, and in fact, he won a silver, the, 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 vid the video was won a silver um, for uh, 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 corporate media and TV awards in, in, just in December here. So uh, congratulations, Bob. It's nice to see you. Next, please. Okay. Um, actually, there is one other slide, uh, one other announcement about. Uh, okay. So there is one other thing that was uh, brought to our attention uh, by Brian McCullough. We have um, there was four Ottawa Centre members who recently contributed uh, some some uh, astro images to the Canada Theatre's production of uh, Night Sky. This is uh, I think Brian is the stage manager manager for that. But um, during the during the uh, the uh, show. Uh, there's actually a, um, an astronomy present, uh, presentation delivered by, a, uh, I guess, a, a fictional professor. And uh, in the background, what you see are images uh, were contributed by, from uh, Rick Wagner, Mike Wirfs, Paul Klemenger, and, um, and uh, Wolf Meyer. So that's kind of neat. And there's also uh, recognition right at the end for the uh, Ottawa Centre uh, 
for, for doing that. So nice, nicely done, and thanks, Brian, for bringing that to our attention. Okay, um, we talked about uh, the Fred Lossing Observatory and our plans for the, f for the future. Um, Gordon's going to give an update. Gordon, over to you. Thanks, Mike. Well, good evening. Um, FLO. Well, for our tour, so far as Mike mentioned, Stealing My Thunder, we have 37 people signed up. Um, there are about six people who haven't responded yet. Um, so if you're here and haven't responded, please do. We've got two dates that we're proposing. <clears throat> the first one is February 20th, 21st rather, the Saturday. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we're hoping to do is have a, an open house during the afternoon and then a star party when it starts to get dark. Um, our cloud date will be the 20th, the Friday, which would mean we wouldn't have the open house. But everything, the observatory will be open, uh, the scope will be running, so you can play with the 16 if you want. Um, our cloud date, if that whole weekend gets shot or is far too cold, we'll figure something in March, probably somewhere around the 13th, 14th. And then the other, the second date is in April, and I believe it's the 10th, 11th. Okay. 10th? Yes. Yep, good. And, and they're both uh, very close to New Moon, so it should be good. And again, we'll do the same thing in April with the open house and the star party afterwards. So if you didn't sign up for the tour and want to come out for the star party, you're more than welcome. Um, if you want to give me a heads up that you're coming just so we can control numbers, that would be good. Um, the other thing is, uh, as was mentioned a, a little while ago, we've inherited, we've been given a, a rather a telescope, an 18 inch daub, and we have a 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain that we're trying to integrate into the FLO. And it's going to mean reorganizing everything. We're going to need a couple of extra buildings, or we're going to need to redo the existing building. We're going to have to make some decisions about the 16 inch, what we're doing with that. And uh, Ron Martin has, Ron St. Martin has agreed to oversee the project, but if any of you think you have the skills to help and the interest to help, he'd be more than happy to talk to you. So either get in touch with him directly or with me. And he's going to try and come up with a plan to implement these things and so we can actually start building, I hope, sometime this summer and be functional before the end of the year. So any, anybody who has skills or interest, please come forward. And that's about all I have for you right now. So, thanks. Any questions for, uh, for Gordon? What type of skills are you looking for? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, basic engineering skills would be good. Uh, just, we need to develop a site plan. Okay, some of the ideas that have been put forth are to tear everything down, build a whole new build building, much larger, with four separate observing areas within the one building. Um, and other suggestions have been a, a group of smaller buildings. Uh, apparently, we do have a, a I think it's a 10-foot dome already. We, we have that, so just we need the foundation for it. So just to help work through the logistics of what do we have, what works best, what can we do for cheap, that's still good and functional. Anyone else? Something that uh, keeps in people's minds is whatever is done will probably require maybe some contacts and some trades and companies that would like to donate in kind their gravel, use of machinery, their, their business, skills, something like that, uh, so, that uh, so that people that don't know what they're doing don't have to do the work. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I know Ron is, is making a few inquiries with some contractors that he knows that, that might be interested in working on it, so. Anyone else? No? Nope. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Gordon.
sounds like a good opportunity for somebody who would like to do a little bit of project management. Okay, next up is um, is uh, Karen uh, Finstad. Karen is our, our new Astro you know, editor, and as I, I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, she's also, the, no I didn't, she's the, also the um, national secretary, and I've asked her to say a few things about, uh, we're fortunate to have her in the Ottawa Centre, is, is also the, the uh, national secretary, so I've asked her to say a few things about the, the role of the national secretary as well. Karen. Thanks, Mike. Uh, did you put up my first slide? Yeah. Thanks. I hope that's uh, legible. I thought you'd be interested to, to see the collection of names of newsletters from across Canada. Uh, I think this is only 24 of the 28 centres. Some of the smaller centres have abandoned their newsletters in favour of uh, a website only. Uh, but it's an, an interesting collection of names and uh, is remarkably little duplication, with uh, one exception. And uh, I don't know about you, but looking at this list makes me think of the old Canadian Football League and the uh, Rough Riders of fond memory. I don't know, maybe it's an Ottawa thing. Uh, next slide, please. But Astronauts is our newsletter, and the, uh, the focus is, is on our. It's, it's about us. It's about our members, uh, what we get up to as a group um, and individually, our accomplishments, our activities, our plans. Um, and uh, for members and by members um, is, is the operative uh, thought here. Um, I have no intention of writing this, writing every issue from top to bottom. Um, I need contributions from as many of you as, as are here. Um, and it's not fair to expect the uh, Centre Council to write all the articles or contribute all the items. Um, your announcements, your thoughts, uh, what you've been up to, um, accomplishments, uh, cartoons, uh, and questions. Um, I have this clever content generating scheme uh, to have uh, everyone send in their questions. I'm calling it NASQ, which stands for Not a Stupid Question. <laughs> and this could be anything. Um, maybe you're sitting there uh, wondering what is being spoken of that everyone seems to understand, but you don't have a clue what's going on. What the heck is a sc smart scope? Um, who is, who was Helen Sawyer Hogg? And is it true, Karen, that you once had tea with her? Why, yes, it is. <laughs> um, or what happens at the General Assembly? Uh, things about our center, things about uh, the RESC in general. Um, basic astronomy questions, um, you know, up to a point we, we can find uh, a link or a resource for you. Um, it's not uh, my intention to, uh, to cover things in the, in the newsletter that you can get elsewhere. You can go to magazines and books and uh, the website to find, uh, the, the web in general, to find out about basic astronomy or cutting edge research or uh, the latest equipment. The newsletter is about us and what we're doing. Um, so I want you to all keep in mind uh, what can be in the newsletter, um, what specific skills are needed, and what is the progress being made on the, uh, the observatory project, uh, um, anything like that. Um, so that's about all I have to say about the newsletter. Uh, Mike did ask me to say something about my role as the national secretary. Um, the uh, RESC, as you know, is a nonprofit corporation. Um, run by, or it has a volunteer board of uh, nine uh, members of the society that are elected and uh, one non-elected member of the board, which is the executive director, he, who is a full-time uh, employee of the RESC. Uh, it's the board's job to oversee the staff at the national office, to set policies and determine budgets, um, to uh, manage the publications um, of the society, um, its investments, its uh, charitable publication activities, and to communicate with the members through the National Advisory Council, um, the permanent committees, and of course the center councils. 
As secretary, my duties include uh, writing agendas and taking minutes for all the meetings of the board and of the National Advisory Council. This comes to something like 15 meetings a year. And so far, not a single one has been less than three hours long. Um, I have to maintain the uh, official bylaw and policy manual documents that are online, uh, administer the dozen or so national email lists, and don't get me started on that one. Uh, I manage the public speaker program, and uh, I write a column for the journal. Um, and that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. I'm seven months into a three-year term and uh, still finding my way. Um, and of course, I participate in all the meetings of the board and the discussions, many of which go on uh, via email between meetings. So it's kind of a constant, a constant thing. And uh, I have to speak up whenever I feel that the, uh, the other directors are veering from the path of righteousness or perhaps just the path of common sense, which happens more often than you might think. Um, there's a lot more to say about the structure of the society in general and uh, how the board works and what it does with your fees um, and how the National Council works. And uh, if there's interest in that, I could uh, come back sometime and give you a longer presentation about the board. But uh, that's all I was planning to say today. Are any Questions? Karen? Yes. Uh, will astronauts uh, uh, continue to, to be electronic, or is there any indication of going back to um, a hard print copy? No, I think we're going to move forward rather than backward. Um, <coughs> the uh, general consensus is that the time, effort, and expense is not. Um, is not worth it. I think that was the uh, consensus of the council, but it's not my intention to do that. However, if you send in questions um, and say, why are we not doing a uh, paper version, then we can come up with a firmer answer. And if a lot of people want a paper version, uh, that can be discussed. I think during the council meeting, I volunteered to reformat it so you can print it out like the old days. I don't know if uh, it will be posted on the internet, uh, on the website as the PDF booklet, but uh, if, if it is, then it will be accessible there. Otherwise, people can find out who's saying this out here in the darkness. And yeah. I'll send it to you. The, um, uh, the, the current version that's posted on the website in which you receive announcements uh, via email every time it's, it's posted um, is formatted in Word and it's produced as a PDF. And the beauty of doing it that way is that you don't have to worry about layout. Um, Robert, if, if you want to take that and reformat it um, and let people know it's available, uh, I think that's fine. Um, I'm going to stick with the, uh, the beauty of no layout task. I think I did it the last time and it was, uh, it was a five minute job to you or someone. Okay, well. But it, it's something that uh, I certainly would not reformat it, just a matter of changing the printing look of it. Well, I think uh, if, if you want to do that and make it available, there's undoubtedly people who would appreciate that very much. By well, the way, the, uh, the journal, in the latest letter to us, are encouraging members to get a hard copy of the journal at an extra cost which I prefer myself. Uh, and I would be willing to pay extra for a hard copy of astronauts. OK, well, that's something for the council to uh, take in, into consideration then. Yeah. I believe uh, this month, everybody is receiving, or maybe it's next nope. next issue. Is it this time? Yes, everyone, everyone in the society across Canada received a hard copy journal. And it's got my column on the back page. <laughs> Okay, thank you.
Here's an idea for um, maybe an astronaut's uh, c contribution. I, I know that many of you, when you go on vacation, you sort of seek out the uh, what you know the astronomy um, sites. You know, if there's a planetarium or or, or 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 something something of interest. And and usually, if I'm not twisting your arm to to, to share it at one of these meetings here, it's a good idea would be actually just to write a little article on it. Maybe maybe include some uh, some um, some photos as well, and and uh, we can have it in the. Uh, astronauts uh, as well. Another thing too that some people like to do is, um, obviously we're limited in time, we can't go on and on with, with presentations, so maybe you want to expand on your presentation and uh, one, one great, great uh, way to do that is by writing an astronaut's uh, article, so, so, so some, some things to do. Um, one thing I forgot to do before we go on, I always like to do this, is uh, are there any uh, people here that are here for the first time tonight, sort of maybe raise your hand? Okay, I see a couple at the back, well, oh my goodness, uh, quite a few for, uh, for February, so welcome. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, what uh, what our group has to offer a, a, a little bit later on. But I um, hope, hope you all enjoy it and uh, say, say hi. I'd like to like certainly like to talk. Um, but welcome for sure. Okay, next up is uh, should be Al Scott. So Al Scott with his uh, ten minute uh, astronomy news segment. All right. Good evening, everybody. So, straight into the news. You have control? Okay, let's go for the first one. So, the first item I want to discuss is Curiosity Science Investigations in Mars. Curiosity, of course, is NASA's Mars rover that's on the surface of Mars, and it's made some interesting discoveries. Uh, the rover itself is made to investigate the environment, look for areas of Mars that may have at one time been uh, conducive to life, look for traces of, of water and organic materials. And so this particular news item is discussing uh, a recent measurement by uh, Curiosity. Um, there have been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of speculation about the presence of methane in the Mars atmosphere over the years. There have been some orbiting spectrometers that have detect, thought they detected traces of methane in the atmosphere. And this is, this is an odd discovery because methane is not stable in the Martian environment. Methane breaks down and oxidizes relatively quickly from the solar ultraviolet radiation and turns into carbon dioxide. So methane has a very short half-life. So if methane is present in the Mars atmosphere, it needs to, be, it needs to have a source. And one of the potential sources of methane is microbial life. So people, scientists are, are very excited about the, about the finding of methane and, and traces of methane indicate that there is an active source of this methane. This picture here, uh, the big picture here, shows some of the potential sources and sinks of methane in in Mars. Not all of them are, are life, of course. Only, only one, that's only one potential. There are other sources of organics which can lead to uh, the discovery of methane. And I'll get into that in a second. The discovery is shown in the bottom left. And this is uh, methane, methane abundance measurements that were made over uh, a couple years, uh, 20 months actually. Uh, and during two of those months, in late 2013 and early 2014, four measurements actually averaged seven parts per billion of methane in the atmosphere. And that's not a lot, seven parts per billion. That's the, the, the graph on the left down here. But you can see the baseline is about 0.7 parts per billion. So the, the, the actual, looks like the equilibrium concentration is rather low, but there seems to be spurts of methane coming up in the vicinity of the Mars rover. Now this is a very interesting discovery because what it means is that there must be some sort of local source, uh, and a relatively small source probably, to be able to, uh, to bump the local concentration up by a factor of 10 uh, and then back, have it come back down. Uh, the rover also detected traces of organics in the soil. It drilled into a rock and measured in an oven uh, organic material coming off of this rock. Uh, and this is rock that has been supposedly on, uh, newly exposed on a rock <coughs> face over millions of years, newly exposed, quote unquote. It hasn't been uh, 
it hasn't been exposed to the radiation of space for quite as long as uh, the rest of the surface. And they found organics. So that's really interesting as well. So some of the p potential uh, sources in sinks, you can see microbes can create methane through uh, just biological processes, but also the weathering of certain types of rock, olivine and pyroxene, for example, when they interact with water, uh, go through a process called serpentization and they give off methane in that. And methane can then be trapped in the permafrost if it exists in a clathrate type thing, and it can spurt out if the permafrost melts locally. Also, another source of surface organics or organics in the rock is from cosmic dust, from uh, dust particles. We know there are carbonaceous dust particles with organics on them. These have been detected and measured and they've fallen to Earth and been measured. So we know these things are falling on the surface of Mars and by the ultraviolet radiation will then uh, come up into the atmosphere temporarily. Uh, this could be the source of the, the continuous background, but it's probably not the source of short bursts of methane. That's more likely to be either uh, local melting, perhaps, or microbes. So a very interesting uh, discovery. They've also been looking at water. The place where the Curiosity rover is is called Gale Crater, and it looks like there's an ancient lake bed there. There actually is clay on the ground that they have taken into their oven and heated up and measured water coming off of this clay. And they can measure the isotope abundance in this, of this water. They can measure uh, the hydrogen to heavy hydrogen or deuterium ratio in this water. And this tells them a little bit about how old the water is. Now, they've dated the, the rocks that they've measured uh, to about three, billion, three or four billion years old. And it's very uncertain, but it's, it's very old. And they've measured the isotope ratio of the water in this rock, and it's roughly half of uh, the current isotope ratio in the Mars atmosphere and water that's in the Mars atmosphere. And what this means, um, over time, the water that's in the Mars atmosphere is escaping to space. The ultraviolet radiation breaks it into hydroxyl OH and a hydrogen ion. And the hydrogen ions will escape into space. And because heavy hydrogen is heavier than light hydrogen, it preferentially stays on the planet and the lighter hydrogen escapes quicker. So over time, the ratio of heavy hydrogen to light hydrogen in Mars's water changes and becomes heavier. And what they found is that the water in this rock that they measured is half as much heavy, hyd heavy hydrogen as in the current atmosphere. So that means there's been significant escape of water from Mars into space over this four billion year period. But the interesting thing is, is that the heavy hydrogen to light hydrogen ratio in this rock is still a factor of three different from what the Earth's is. And we don't think the Earth's water has escaped very much because we have protection for, uh, with our magnetic field from the solar radiation. So our water isn't escaping to space like Mars's has. So what this means is that uh, a lot of the water had already escaped into space when this uh, water became entrapped in the rock. So probably three times as much escaped into space in the, in the, in the time up to this rock forming and then another uh, half has escaped since then. So very interesting discoveries, uh, real uh, scientific uh, sleuth uh, discoveries from the Curiosity rover. So move on to the next one. This one uh, caught my eye. It's a very interesting uh, system. This is uh, an image of star, not an image, but an artist impression of the star system J1407, a young K-type star, about 90% of the mass of the sun, and only about 16 million years old, so young by, by solar standards. Uh, this system is located in the constellation Centaurus, and it's about 420 light years away from Earth. The, sun, the star there shines with an apparent magnitude of 12.3, so you could see it with a backyard telescope. Astronomers have discovered a planetary ring system that they saw eclipse this young sun-like star in the year 20, 2007. The system, consisting of over 30 rings, 
each of them tens of millions of kilometers in diameter, is much larger and heavier than the ring system of Saturn. The rings encircle a substellar object, either a giant planet or brown dwarf. If we could replace Saturn's rings with the rings that have been seen around this object, they would easily be visible at night and be many times larger than the full moon in our sky at the distance of Saturn. And you can see the inset here shows a, a picture of the orbit of this planet and its ring system to scale. So you can see that the rings are a significant fraction of the orbit. Furthermore, they found gaps in the rings which would indicate that satellites or exomoons are forming around this, uh, this young planet. The details that were seen in the light curve are incredible. The eclipse lasted for several weeks, but there are rapid changes on the time scale of 10 minutes as a result of fine structure in the rings. At times, the rings block 95% of the star's light, of the parent star. The total diameter of the ring system is nearly 120 million kilometers, more than 200 times as large as the rings of Saturn. The ring system likely contains roughly an Earth's worth of mass in light obscuring dust particles. The actual angular size of the ring system, if you could image it, it's only about uh, three milliarc seconds on the sky, so you wouldn't be able to see the rings or image them directly. But because this thing passes between the star and us, we can see it uh, as it obscures the light from the star. Al, are, are the proportions correct here? Like the size of the center object with the rings? Are, are all the proportions correct? We don't really know what the size of the center object is, but the, the rings are shown in proportion in the upper picture. They're not actually certain how massive the center object is, and that's something they want to find out, whether it's a brown dwarf. They believe it's, it's probably 10 to 40 times the mass of Jupiter. Difficult to constrain from the data that they have of that one observation seven or eight years ago. The planetary science community has theorized for decades that planets like Jupiter and Saturn at an early stage would have had much, very large disks like this around them that then led to the formation of all of their satellites, the Galilean <laughs> moons, for example, over millions of years. This is the first time that such a process has been caught in the act. The researchers are encouraging amateur astronomers to help monitor J1407, which would help detect the next eclipse of the rings, which are expected probably around 2017, give or take a, a year or so. Uh, observations of J1407 can be reported to the American Association of Variable Star Observers. This is a very interesting type of uh, serendipitous observation that astronomers can do on, on many young stars if you could find them um, and, and add to our scientific knowledge because if these things are common, uh, it's something that's easily detectable from an amateur setup. So, very interesting uh, discovery. Thank you. I think you can see as well that the uh, we, the, uh, the projector is uh, working a little bit better tonight. Uh, I know T Tony, you're probably thinking about it, and uh, and Eric, you are as well when you're, as you're uh, get ready to show your Im your images. So keep your fingers crossed, and uh, we'll, 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 I think we're going to see some outstanding uh, images, including some beautiful um, uh, images of uh, of Comet Lovejoy. So next up is is, is Carmen Nelson uh, on on my um, one of my favorite segments. Of, uh, of my uh, of this pro of this program, and that is, um, she has a series on uh, historical figures in uh, in astronomy. These are people who have helped um, helped advance uh, uh, astronomy. I think you'll find her presentations are very similar to uh, when we heard uh, what was it back in September, I think September or October, uh, um, where she sort of kept us riveted to our seat. Carmen, come on up. Hello again, everybody. Glad to be back to give me some more of a history lesson, I guess. Uh, so the gentleman I'm going to talk about tonight is um, Johannes Hevelius. He was a Polish astronomer of the 17th century that actually probably few of us know anything about, especially on, on, in, uh, on this side of the world. And it's very much undeserved because he made many important contributions to the study of astronomy. Uh, next slide. Um, perhaps you may have heard of him, but uh, maybe not by the Latinized version of his name, which is Johannes Hevelius. Um, if you were uh, German, he would be called Johann Hewel or Johann Hewelke. And in Polish, he's known as Jan Hewelius. 
And Hevelius himself signed his name as Johannes Hofelius when he was 20 and Hans Hoelke when he was 28. But we all know him now today in his Latinized version, Johannes Hevelius. He was born in Danzig, and uh, that's now modern-day Gdansk in Poland, on January 28, 1611, to parents of German and Czech uh, nationalities. Uh, his parents were very wealthy. They owned a very prosperous brewery that brewed the then-famous Jopin beer. Uh, next slide. And that beer you can still buy today if you go to Poland. Of course, now they have renamed it Hevelius, of course, trying to capitalize on the name, uh, but you can still drink it. Um, Johannes was the only surviving son of the family. Uh, three others uh, died very young, and he had six sisters. So there was certainly considerable pressure on him to take over the family business. Uh, but at age 16, he fell in love with mathematics and astronomy. Uh, this due mainly to the inspiring lessons given by his math teacher, Peter Kruger. Next slide. Um, so passionate was Hevelius about astronomy in particular that he convinced his parents to pay his teacher to give him extra private lessons in astronomy. Uh, from Kruger, he learned not only the required physics, um, but also how to build astronomical instruments from wood and metal. At age 19, Hevelius left for the Netherlands to study law at the University of Leiden, um, but he, his heart was not in it, especially after he witnessed an eclipse of the sun and saw Saturn veil the moon in a, in a lunar eclipse. And while at university, he also took courses then in math and me mechanics and optics, and after one year abandoned his law degree and went off to travel. Uh, he spent a year in London and then went on to France where he met with some very famous astronomers like Pierre Gassendi, next slide, and Ismail Bouliot, next slide, in uh, Paris. And he was ready to set off for Italy and meet none other than, none other than uh, Galileo. But by then, his parents had had enough of him and ordered him home uh, and uh, told him that he had to take over the family brewery. Uh, by now, it was 1634, and Hevelius was 25 years old. Next slide. Um, the dutiful son returned. He got married and studied the art of making beer and was admitted to the Brewers Guild in 1634. But astronomy beckoned again. In 1639, Kruger, his former math teacher, was dying, and Hevelius went to see him one last time. And on his deathbed, Kruger encouraged uh, him to return to astronomy. And so moved was Hevelius by this that he returned home and immediately passed the running of the brewery on to his wife, who, by the way, did a very excellent job. And uh, he began to get busy to build a private observatory on the roofs of uh, three adjoining row houses that he owned. Next slide. And that's a, um, a picture of, you can see the very large telescope at the top there. The, the, those row houses he, he owned himself. So um, he um, ground the lenses for his telescopes and uh, built mounts for the state-of-the-art quadrants and sextants and built a very large tubeless refracting telescope with a focal length of 150 feet, which you see in that picture there. Uh, next slide. Here's a close-up of... You can get the perspective of the, you know, the people standing on the roof there and how large that thing was. Like Tycho Brahe, he built very large measuring instruments and was able with them to greatly improve naked eye measurements of star positions. And he didn't use telescopic sights on his equipment. Um, yet he was able to measure star positions very accurate uh, to the nearest one minute of an arc, uh, outdoing Tycho Brahe himself. And over the next 16 years, he had the best observatory in Europe uh, at the time, and he called it Sternberg, uh, that means star castle. Hevelius somehow found the time also in 1641, while all this was going on, to become an alderman of Danzig and then a magistrate. Uh, the city of Danzig fully supported all of his astronomical interests, and in 1647, the city gave him a six-foot azimuthal quadrant. Next slide that had been lying unused in the Danzig armory. And Hevelius <coughs> mounted it on his observing tower and used it to measure angles between neighboring stars. Uh, these measurements were collated later in a star catalog that I'll talk about in, in a few moments. But before I go on to the list of his very great contributions in astronomy, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about his personal life. In uh, 1649, his father died. And in 1662, his wife died. And there were no children from this marriage. And then in 1663, Hevelius married the 16-year-old daughter of a rich merchant. Uh, her name was Katharina Elisabetha Kopman. Next slide. There are the two of them observing together. So 
he married basically a 16-year-old woman and young girl, and he himself at the time was 52. Um, but the age difference, surprisingly, was no issue for them. Uh, Katerina had a very keen interest in astronomy, very, very unlike his former wife, and observed with him very enthusiastically. And the family grew and they raised three daughters. Hevelius and his uh, observatory were famous all through Europe. Uh, King Louis XIV of France, next slide. So there's King Louis, um, visited him and gave him a yearly grant for his work. And the Royal Society of London admitted him as a member in 1664, and Hevelius corresponded often over the next 14 years with his secretary, with uh, its secretary, Oldenburg, as well as with Wallace uh, Flamsteed and Edmund Halley. And uh, I showed you pictures earlier uh, of Gassendi and Bullio in France. In 1660, King John II and Queen Maria of Poland even visited him and gave him their patronage. In fact, four consecutive Polish kings supported him financially. Uh, King Jan Kamiers uh, visited him in 1659 and raised the family to nobility uh, in 1660. And King John III Sobieski, his biggest patron, uh, next slide, regularly visited him and um, gave him a very generous uh, visit at the observatory from 1677 to 1683. And in the end, paid uh, um, Hevelius a very generous pension of 1,000 gulden annually and freed him from paying taxes. From 1642 to 1645, Hevelius studied sunspots on the sun. Next slide. Uh, it was a very important time to do so because the time period spanned the uh, first part of a period of minimum of solar activity. And he was the first one to call the bright markings close to sunspots faculae. It's a term that we still use today. He was then also able to determine the solar rotation period with great accuracy for the time and uh, much more accurately than his predecessors. Uh, next slide. In November 1644, he observed that Mercury goes through phases uh, that had been uh, predicted earlier by Copernicus, and he just verified that was true. And for the next 10 years, he began to study the moon. Uh, in fact, today, to this day, he is um, called the founder of lunar topography. He charted the lunar surface, uh, next slide, uh, that's one of his drawings, and determined that the very large uniform gray uh, regions were low plains, and the bright contrasting regions were mountains. He discovered the moon's libration and longitude, and his uh, diagrams of the lunar phases and estimates of mountain heights produced the best maps for at least a century after that. And all of this he published in a work he called Selenographia in 1647. Uh, yet in spite of all this great science, believe it or not, um, and being the scientist that he was, he actually believed that the moon was inhabited by beings he called the Selenites. Ah, uh, the Selenites. That piqued my curiosity. So I did some research on the Selenites. And did you know that they have monthly meetings just like we do? <laughs> um, and in fact, I have a photograph of what a typical gathering of them would look like. Next slide. Them, What's that? Do they webcast them too? Um, I don't know. We'll have to ask them. Next slide. There they are. <laughs> Believe it or not, um, when I was putting this talk together, um, I went on Google, Google Images, and just for a lark, Googled selenites. And you would not believe the number of pictures that popped up there. From all these different kinds of scientific, uh, or rather, sci-fi websites, you know, modern day, uh, uh, contemporary sci-fi websites. And the thing that I had to really laugh about the most was, here in our 21st century, everybody's still obsessed with selenites, and that term was coined by Hevelius in the 1600s. Yet the same term is still used, so I thought it was pretty amazing. <clears throat> um, so, uh, next slide. On, Hevelius went to study the comets. So he observed comets of 1647, 1652, uh, 1661, and actually that comet was probably Ikea Zhang, and 1672, 1677, 1682, and this one was probably Comet Halley. He believed that the comet orbits were parabolic, uh, which actually is sometimes true. It's not always the case. <clears throat> and all of this he published in a work he called Prodomus Cometicus in 1665, and later in 1668 he wrote another book. Uh, he called it Cometographa. Um, in 1662, we published a book <clears throat> about the study of the periodic variable star uh, the in the constellation Cetus the Whale. Just got to have a bit of drink here. It's pretty dry up here. Um, next slide. 
<clears throat> so he called this star Mira, which is actually the name we still use, and it means the wonderful. And today this star is also known as Omicron Seti. In, um, in 1666, Hevelius was offered the directorship of a new observatory in Paris. Um, he declined it actually, and it was, it was given to Cassini instead. Next slide. Why he did this is clear when you hear what he wrote about himself much later in 1681. This is a quote. He wrote, I am a citizen of the Polish world who, for the glory of his country and the good of science, worked so much, and while not boasting much, executed his work with the most effort according to his abilities. In 1670, Hevelius made an independent discovery of Nova uh, 1670 Signi and was the first to publish a work about it, although it had been uh, observed independently by um, a, a Cartesian monk in uh, Dijon, France, one month earlier, but it was not published. Because Hevelius had such detailed records of that part of the sky over several years, he was able to write with certainty that the Nova was, not, was new. Um, it declined in brightness over the coming months, but in 1671, um, it became even more brilliant uh, than at first, and um, it, he studied extensively, um, not only that, but also Cassini at the Paris Observatory. And then it faded again. It was last seen by astronomers of the day in 1672. Actually, it's still a nova um, in our time. It's called C.K. Vilpeculae, and a very detailed article appeared in the Astrophysical Journal as recently as 1985. In 1673, Hevelius published Machina Celestis, a series of, gotta have a drink again. It's terrible up here. <coughs> I've lost my teaching voice. In 1673, Hevelius um, published Machina Celestis, um, a series of star maps based on measurements he made of star positions. And it was then that the Royal Society of London began to question the accuracy of his measurements. This was thanks to a dispute he had with Robert Hooke over the use of telescopic sights on observing equipment. Well, Hevelius didn't use them, and Hooke argued that there was no way that he could do proper scientific work without them. So persuasive and, and forceful was Hooke that the Society on May 26, 1679, next slide, dispatched a very young Edmund Halley, then just 23 years old, to Poland, armed with a two-foot quadrant with a telesco telescopic sight. So his job was to measure the same star positions that Hevelius did, and uh, they were going to compare their uh, observations, um, Hevelius with his open sight quadrants, and um, Halley with his telescopic sights, and they would see who got more accurate results. Well, Halley was not successful. He underestimated the state-of-the-art equipment that Hevelius had owned, and the fact also that Hevelius had very keen eyesight. He could see stars of seventh magnitude, and also what a skilled observer he was. So Halley returned to London, and the dispute was over. Hevelius' uh, um, reputation was intact. Um, next slide. Unfortunately, this was not the end of the troubles facing Hevelius. On September 26, 1679, when he was 68 years old and away from home, a coachman left a burning candle in the stable and a fire broke out. It quickly spread to the wooden platform uh, where Hevelius had um, all his equipment, and in no time at all, all three houses were on fire. Many townspeople came to help carry out the equipment and the documents, and some to steal them also. But unfortunately, all of his instruments his optical workshop, his printing workshop, everything was completely destroyed. And thanks to the quick thinking of his 13-year-old daughter, Katerina, uh, at least his star catalog uh, and some other books were, were salvaged. Well, Hevelius was devastated and his health deteriorated. He wrote to the King of France to ask for extra funds and was given them. And this was also matched by the King of Poland. And uh, Hevelius set to work to rebuild his observatory. Uh, next slide. And thankfully, it was ready in time for him to, to observe the Great Comet of December 1680. Then, then he moved on to his greatest work, a star catalog of, of 1,564 stars, whose positions he had carefully measured and recorded since 1657. He charted 16 ne nebulous stars, although only the two that we now know of as M31. Uh, next slide. That's, uh, sorry, next slide. Oh. I think I may have forgotten to tell you the next. Go to the next slide. Okay, that's M31. That's the adrenaline gland. Okay. 
So um, only the two that we know as M31, uh, <clears throat> that's the Andromeda gal galaxy. And the next uh, slide, M44, and that's Beehive Cluster, um, <laughs> were actually deep sky objects. And in spite of this, Messier himself actually spent many hours looking for the other ones because he thought that Hevelius was such a great observer that he's got to have, uh, you know, he, was, he had to be right about the others when, when he actually wasn't. Uh, next slide. Unfortunately, this great work was never published in his lifetime because suddenly in uh, November 1686, Hevelius felt Ill, fell ill and died on January 28th, 1687. Thankfully, Hevelius' uh, wife, Katerina uh, Elisabetha, completed the book and included 600 more stars that she and Johann had observed together. And it was published in, in 1690. Um, this is the, the cover of that book. And after her death in 1693 at age 46, her daughters in inherited a complete set of Hevelius' published works. And the eldest, Katerina, inherited the most beautiful of the, st of the star uh, catalogs. Just take a look here for a second. I have, I think I'm missing a page. Yeah, okay, I'll go on. Um, yes, she inherited the most beautiful, uh, the most beautiful book of them all. And uh, unfortunately, Katerina had married a very greedy husband, and he sold most of the books to a museum in Russia. But he didn't include the Star Catalog manuscript. In 1734, um, during the Russian siege um, of Danzig, a bomb fell directly on the room where Hevelius' manuscripts and, and instruments were being held by the son-in-law. But the star catalog miraculously was not damaged, and it eventually was given to the Danzig Institute of Technology many years later. Uh, then at the beginning of the Second World War, the Germans moved it to a nearby village. And when that village was heavily bombed, the star catalog once again miraculously survived and it's now kept at the Utah Brigham uh, Young uh, University, and it's been there since 1971. Hevelius cataloged 56 constellations in, in, in this particular star catalog as well, um, other than the 1,500 stars. And um, he also invented and named constellations and included them in this book. And he printed the book in his own printing shop and engraved his own printing plates, and I'm gonna show you some of them now. Um, with beautiful drawings of the, of the constellations of the night sky, and he called this stellar atlas uh, Firmamentus Sobieskianium Sive Uraniographia. So the Sobieskianium is in um, deference to the king, uh, uh, John III, who uh, had that Sobieski, was his last name. So seven of his constellations are still in use today. Uh, the first one is Canis Venatici, uh, Tissi, uh, he actually called this two separate constellations, Asteria and the first hunting dog, and Chara the second. And you have to remember that these are engravings that he actually did. If you Google Hevelius, uh, you'll right away get that star catalog coming up. And I'm only showing you uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, they're just beautiful plates to, to, to look at. Uh, next slide. The second one is Lacerta, the lizard. Uh, next one. Leo Minor, the small lion. Next slide. Lynx, the lynx. Next slide. Scutum, the shield there. Uh, that, the, its full name is Scutum Sobieskianium, or Sobieski's shield, and it's in honor of King John III Sobieski of Poland, who was uh, victorious at the Battle of Vienna. Uh, next slide. Sextants, uh, that's the astronomical sex, the sextant that was named in memory of the equipment he lost in the great fire of his, at his observatory. Uh, next slide. Vulpecula cum answer, that's the fox and the goose. It's now, now just called Vulpecula the, the fox. <coughs> next slide. And I'll just show you three that are no longer uh, used. Cerberus, the three-headed dog guarding Hades. Uh, next one, Mons Maenalus, that's the mountain on the bottom that the gentleman is standing on. And uh, next slide, Triangulum uh, Minus, the small triangle. So as I said, I'll just go back to what I was talking about earlier. Um, unfortunately, this great work was never published because uh, then Hevelius fell ill and passed away. And uh, next slide. So after his death then, this, this star catalog miraculously just survived. It had gone through many different ha um, hands. 
Um, it ended up um, almost being bombed and, and so on, and now it's, it's uh, now kept at uh, Utah's Brigham um, Young uh, University. It's been there since 1971. It's still there. Next slide. And that's the, the first page of it. Uh, next slide. So the name Hevelius, thankfully, still lives on in the sky. In 1931, uh, a main belt asteroid called uh, 5703 was named Hevelius by K. Reinmuth of Heidelberg. And in 1935, this crater on the moon that you see, the large one in the center, was named after him. It's 118 kilometers in, in diameter on the western border of the Ocean of Storms. Uh, next slide. And uh, there was a stamp issued in honor of his, the 400th anniversary of his birthday um, in uh, 2011. And next slide. And there is a statue of him in Gdansk. Any questions? Questions? Do you name the uh, Fly Cluster, F-U-S-C-A? Do you name that because it was shown in the Northern Hemisphere? It is present. There is a constellation in the Southern Hemisphere with the same name. Oh, really? Oh, I don't know. It's not I mean, one of the maps. It was on the map? Uh, do you want to go back? Yeah, go back about three or four. <laughs> right there. That one, right in the middle. Right oh, Muska there. Yeah, that's actually a constellation. Did he name that? Um. That I don't know. Because it, is, it does exist in the southern hemisphere. It's not the same. Not I, I don't think he did name it. Okay. I don't think he did. But I could always Google it, but I, I don't think he did. I don't recognize that name because I went through most of the, of the plates. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I forget the name of the uh, beings you thought lived on the moon. Selenites. He was a great observer. Did, did, did anything mention that what he observed that led him to that conclusion? Did he see something that he interpreted as you know, cows? Or um, it didn't pop up in what I had read. I think it was just, he just was a dreamer, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, too much beer, too much of his family beer. <laughs> Carmen, how did you find him? How did you find him on this phone? Um, I have a book on just general names in astronomy. I think it's by somebody north. Um, and I was just reading a chapter, and he was talking about constellations, and then he said, oh, and something about uh, yes, and Hevelius was one of the ones who did something, and he never mentioned it again. I thought, Hevelius? I've never heard of Hevelius before. So I looked at another book of mine, and there was a little bit more on it, and then I just started Googling, and I was shocked, actually, at how prolific he was. And, and yet, I don't think any, does anybody, has anyone here ever heard of him? Jim? Yeah. One. So it was uh, a big shock to me, but... Um, Especially since uh, he had done so much work on, you know, the, the topography of the moon and everything else that we just uh, sort of take for granted now, and the constellations. Mm -hmm. Those star charts, uh, the mirror images, as if you're looking from the other side. Of the yes, space. yes, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, I, right. So Ursa Major was backwards. Right? Yes, right. It's from. It's, it's as if you were. It's, it's as if you were in space looking down to Earth. Strange that he would do that because who in that day could go out into space, but. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, thank you. I can't imagine just how much research uh, Carmen did. You know, a real true labor of love. Uh, I, I, I imagine it must have been months and months of uh, research and uh, just to prepare this presentation tonight. So thank you again, Carmen. Well done. I thoroughly enjoy it. Okay. Before we go to break, I wanted to say a couple of things about um, um, membership benefits, particularly for the, those of you who are, are new tonight. Um, a couple of things that we have here. We have a, um, we have a telescope loan library. It's very similar to a, lo a book library. You can accept you sign out, uh, sign out telescopes. Uh, Al Scott, who's the librarian, he's here tonight. Um, if he's the fellow who spoke about the 10-minute uh, uh, astronomy news segment. Uh, he, can, uh, he can, if you have any questions, he can talk about, uh, about that. Actually, if you want, you can also Google the Ted Bean Loan Library, and you'll see uh, pictures of the telescopes, uh, at least some, and we even have even more than, than what's shown on the, um, on the, uh, on the internet there. Um, next slide, please. 
some of the other benefits with, uh, with your membership, you, you get uh, a yearly subscription to Sky News Magazine. Uh, you get the electronic version of the uh, RAC Journal. Uh, and of course, this month, as, uh, as Karen mentioned earlier, uh, every member is getting a, a printed edition. You also get the Observer's Handbook, which is available now in um, electronic version. I mentioned that. Uh, I believe it's now at, at ten dollars um, more if you wish to have that uh, to have that handy. Well, well, well worth it as well. And then I know that um, astronauts, uh, um, Karen will do a, a, certainly a fine job. Next slide. So, um, if you're interested in, the, in, in membership, it's a yearly fee of seventy-two dollars. Of course, if, if you if for uh, family members, uh, if you want to have a family membership, it's uh, sixty-seven dollars base cost plus ten dollars for each additional uh, ten dollars for uh, an, an adult. So. Um, and then uh, five dollars for, for for youth, and there's a, there's a, there's a youth membership. There's a standalone youth membership as well. Next slide. Okay, so um, we do have a quite. A, by the way, if, if you didn't pick up at the break, the um, your tickets for the door prize, uh, please uh, please do uh, right after this. Um, it's mean we have. I, I put out a call for door prizes, and uh, wow, we got quite a few that came in. So that that's that's always nice. Um, and. Uh, all right, the next segment is the uh, observer reports. Now this is where I'm really hoping that the, uh, our, our resolution is improved quite a bit, so I'm excited about that. So let's use this, because we have a little bit more time in this meeting, let's use this to have, have a lot more sort of interaction with our, with our um, observers. And, and uh, feel free to ask them lots of questions on how they, uh, how they prepare their images and, uh, and so forth. So first up, uh, we actually have a number of, um, of, of uh, oh yes, I forgot, um, of, um, of presenters, the first one is uh, something that I'm sure many many of you have seen from um, from uh, that came out from the uh, basically as a, a high high resolution Hubble um, images of the uh, of the Andromeda Galaxy. So let's see if that works.
pretty impressive. Okay. Uh, yeah, for sure. Okay, next up are the our observer reports. First, uh, you're up, Jim. Sorry, take it down. <laughs> Talk slowly, we have lots of time. Okay. Uh, so this image was uh, meant to be presented actually several months ago, but uh, because of the Christmas break and such, I didn't get a chance to. Um, it was taken on the 20th of December with my 10-inch uh, uh, RC scope. And uh, it's of an area on the, uh, the west side of the moon called the, the Marius Hills. It uh, shows up better here. Is there a laser pointer here? Yep. The green dot? Yep. These little pimples up here, each one of those is a, uh, a volcanic dome roughly a kilometer to two kilometers in diameter and two to five hundred meters tall. And there are several, several hundred of them in this area. And it's been a, an area that I've uh, tried hard to get a good image of. It's because it's so far onto the western limb, you have to get the terminator just right to uh, get the nice long shadows cast off of the, each of the bumps. <coughs> And if you do a little online research of this area, there's also a pit that's famously known as the Marius Pit, I think, that's been recorded by the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it's, a, uh, it's just a, an area where the surface has caved in and it's like a, a cave, basically. It's uh, visible from, from orbit. So that's a neat, uh, neat shot that I was happy to get. Uh, next, please. So another shot of the moon. This one was taken a little bit more recently. Um, it was on the 14th of January, on one of the uh, rare clear days that we've had this winter and exceptionally cold. I believe it was around minus 25 when I took this. And it was around 6 in the morning, um, this being one of the, the later phases, just past uh, the last quarter. Again, it was with a 10-inch reflector. Uh, two times Barlow. I especially liked the uh, the fact that sun was setting on the crater of Copernicus, so just the last little lip is illuminated. And I don't know if you can see down on the bottom these little goosebumps down here, casting quite long shadows. I thought that was pretty neat. Like these features are probably only uh, maybe 500 meters to a kilometer high, but they're casting shadows that are on the order of 30 kilometers long, which is kind of neat. Uh, another couple uh, clusters of volcanic domes. There's five of them there. You can actually see the, uh, the little crater at the top, the caldera. And then there's a big one over here. So more evidence of volcanic activity on the moon. Uh, next one. Uh, this was a shot, uh, again, another rare clear day <laughs> in December, uh, taken with a 4-inch refractor and a Bader uh, safety wedge. I used two different filters, uh, the top one calcium, uh, calcium K and the bottom one solar continuum, uh, which is a narrow band in the green spectrum. But then I just uh, captured the image in grayscale. But uh, when people talk about the effect of the atmosphere on your seeing, um, you can see the difference in the clarity of the two images. The top one is down in the UV band, so down deep in the blue and purple, where the atmosphere affects, um, affects that color range more so than more towards the red. So that's why the, one of the reasons why the solar continuum is so much clearer. It's just an effect of the atmosphere. Uh, anything else to note on that? Nope. The uh, one thing that I was impressed by, I wasn't expecting to get such a nice sh shot. Um, this is uh, Sunspot Group 2241 and 2242, by the way, if you want to look them up later. Uh, 
There's a, a lot of solar flare activity from this group at the time. Um, but this was very low on the sky. It was like the day before, uh, day before the uh, winter solstice, so it was about as low in the sky as it could be. It was about 20 degrees above the horizon for me, just clearing my neighbor's house. So uh, with it being that low, I wasn't expecting to get any kind of decent seeing, but I ended up being pretty lucky. Uh, next one. So this is a more recent shot. This is from the 31st. Um, using the new solar uh, scope that I got. It's actually an a H-alpha filter that I can put on to any scope that I want. In this case, it was a two and a half inch refractor uh, that I put it on. And this is actually a composite of uh, several images taken at different exposure times. So uh, short exposure to get the features on the face and then a longer exposure to get the prominences. I have a question, is the, uh, is the uh Projector distorting the, uh, yes. the shape. Yes, it is. You can see it by the round. Why does it, does it look not round? Because the sun is not round. It is slightly oblate. Yeah. But it, that's exaggerated. There, the projector is creating a problem here. Probably it, it's, tonight. It's, yes. it's possible, yes. Okay. But it is slightly oblate. It's even more so on the screen here. <laughs> it's about two to one uh, on this screen. Um, at the time that I captured the image. Um, I caught a bit of a minor flare happening. I don't, I don't know what uh, sunspot group number that is, but uh, I caught a bit of a solar flare there. And what I was really impressed by was the size of this prominence up in the northwest. Um, I hadn't, since I've been observing H-alpha, I hadn't seen a prominence that large before. And it was quite fascinating to watch. Uh, if we go to the next one, please. Uh, this is with the uh, four times Barlow added. Um, the detail in this prominence, it can just make out the little wispy details here. It's, it's better on this screen here, the gamma is higher. Um, but even within the course of about a half an hour, this, sorry, the, uh, this wall of prominence would break up into multiple loops that would then recombine. It was fascinating to watch. If it wasn't so bloody cold outside, I would have stayed out all, all day. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so that's, I think I'll add that was it, wasn't it? So Jim, you were saying this is a new, uh, what was it again that you, you purchased for your scope? Well, yeah, it's, um, you can get these from several different um, makers, but it's, um, it's a combination of an, an Edelon, which is a, a special interference coating um, that you can tune to be exactly on the uh, frequency for uh, hydrogen alpha emission in the sun, 656.3 nanometers. And that's combined with a blocking filter, which goes down by the eyepiece to further narrow it down and cut out all of the infrared and UV for eye safe. And uh, you can buy these to use with your own refractor. It has to be a refractor. Reflectors, it, it won't work because it's uh, too much energy. But um, yeah, the one that I got is made in the UK. It's called Solar Scope. It's fairly expensive. I got it used. I wouldn't have bought it otherwise. But uh, Lunt also makes a similar type device. Or you can buy a dedicated Solar Scope, which is the same thing, but they just throw in the scope with it. But it's the same kind of idea. A tunable filter on the end and this blocking filter. It's like a system that works together. It's very outstanding. Thank, Thank you. Next up is uh, John Thompson. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been following Comet Lovejoy. I was able to get several images of it. This first one was uh, taken on January 20th, and it was minus 20 degrees that night, and I do have an Ioptron star tracker, but it was too cold to try and get it set up in a line, so I tried something I hadn't tried before, at least uh, not for comets. I have a, a fairly fast telephoto lens, a 135mm f2.5, so I set uh, an intervalometer, like an external one, 
to take three second, actually this, uh, actually, this was five second exposures. Um, so this was a stack of um, 24 five second exposures, which gives the effect of two minutes. And then I used uh, deep, sky track, deep, deep sky stacker to, tr to stack them all. So this was taken from my back deck, and it was just a fixed uh, camera on a fixed, a fixed tripod, no tracking at all, and deep sky stacker rotated and translated the images to give the effect of tracking. So you can see a bit of a tail there. That was uh, January 20th, I believe. Is there more? Yeah. Okay, well, that's the same image that I processed through a program that I discovered a few months ago. It's called um, astrometry.net, which is the front end, the, part, the guts of it that actually allow you to do uh, plate solving and uh, image uh, identification is called nova.astrometry.net. You can upload images, and in most cases, about between 10 and 20 seconds later, it comes back with a complete uh, solution showing any deep sky objects in it. It shows the, the, it'll give you the RA and deck of the center of the image, the pixel scale, the dimensions in degrees, and it'll also show you the orientation with respect to north on a sort of a global star map. So this one, there was a couple of deep sky objects there. I went and looked them up to see what they were. The NGC 1156 is a very faint galaxy. And NGC 1170, it turns out, is a non-existent, one of the, one of the ones called non-existent, not by the RNGC, but uh, it was reported by two astronomers in the 1800s that, who had been observing a comet and then uh, just a degree or two away from the comet, they discovered this little patch of what they call thought was nebulosity, but it's never been seen ever since. So the thought is it might have been a knot in the tail of that comet. So anyways, there was two people uh, were in, on record in the original NGC as seeing it, but it's never been seen since. Excellent. Uh, this one was taken on the, um, the 26th of January. And this, this was a three second exposure. That's the equivalent of almost uh, like four and a half minutes. It was, um, I believe, it was about 70 three second exposures. I found by trial and error that what I can do sort of conservatively is 400 divided by the focal length of the lens gives more or less the maximum I can take without excessive trailing. In this case, I did blow it up a bit so that uh, that was cropped and blown up by a factor of two or three, so you can see the trailing there, but in the original image, there's very little trailing. I mean, again, it, you see a bit of a tail coming out there. And That's it. Okay, there was one more I took last night. I wasn't sure if you... We didn't get it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. So anyways, that shows what you can do without a tracking setup, that you can actually take, if you have a fast lens, you can take numerous, you know, three to five second images and just stack them, and it gives the equivalent of this tracking system. I've got my camera here that I can, if anybody wants to talk about it, I can show you. All right, thank you, John. Okay. okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, so uh, this is an image of Comet Lovejoy that I took back on. Uh, um, January 20th from uh, Teeples Hill, which I like to go to lately because it's really dark. Um, the, uh, the comet was about 45 degrees above the horizon when I started imaging it, and um, so it, it differed from a lot of other comets I've attempted in the past in that typically you have a comet that's close to the horizon and you've got maybe 30 minutes to, uh, to image it. So that presents a problem in terms of the exposure time that you want to, uh, that you can get and so typically you just use a, um, a one-shot color uh, camera. In my case, uh, because I had uh, enough time, um, because it was so high, what I decided to do is use my SBIG STF 8300 uh, monochrome camera, and uh, I used my LRGB filters um, to, uh, to capture it. So what I did, though, is I took, um, I took three minute luminance images, uh, followed by one minute each of red, green, and blue. And typically when I'm taking pictures of deep space objects, I'll take all the red images together, all the blue t together, all the green together, all the luminance together, and so on. 
and that just allows me to uh, to not have to change the filter often and have to refocus. But for this comment, I decided that um, that I was going to risk not focusing in between each uh, image, but because I'd, I'd go a luminance red, green, blue, and then root luminance red, green, blue again over and over and over, what that would do is allow me to have separation in the stars when I went to go back and process it. Um, and so what I, I captured two hours of exposure on this, uh, processed it in uh, Pixim site, and I figured that I would, um, I would process two images and put them together afterwards. So what I did is I uh, aligned on just the comet and then just on the stars, and that gave me two images that I could then combine later. Um, for the comet, there's a function in Pixinsight called uh, Comet Alignment, and that allows you to um, specify on the first image where the center of the comet is, and then on the last image, and then it computes based on the time in between uh, for every image when it goes to align it, how much the comet has tracked, and then stacks it together, um, or sorry, aligns it together so that the comet is sharp. And when you go to integrate it afterwards, uh, what you do is you, um, in my case, I use a Windsorized uh, Sigma, um, Windsorized Sigma clip algorithm to uh, to integrate it, and I set the Sigma high value very low. And what that does is that because say on say when you go to uh, when you go to a stack say the luminance image, each successive luminance image is separated in time enough that the stars then are far enough apart that statistically they get rejected. So, um, and if I could, uh, well, here I'll show you in in a second. Here I've got a second image with just the um, just the comet without the stars. But uh, first of all, though, what I did is I took the other images and, or sorry, the, I stacked the images together a second time, and uh, and I aligned them using the star alignment tool to uh, to get the stars round. Otherwise, if you um, if you were to just stack on the comet, uh, sorry, if you, were, if you were to stack on the comet with uh, it moving like that, you would get stars that would blur, right? So, um, so I needed the second uh, second picture where the stars were then um, sharp and the comet was blurred, and I used a tool called um, Star Mask then to be able to extract all the stars from that image and subtract the comet that was effectively blurred by doing it that way. Um, I then took uh, a tool called Pixel Math and used the maximum function to combine the two of them to get this image here. So I'll just show you the, uh, the image I took without the stars uh, is this one right here. And what, impressed, what impressed me most about this one is that when you go back and forth between the one that has stars, it's funny how the stars kind of distract a little bit from it. It's, I've had a lot of people tell me that they like the one with the stars better, yet when you go and look at the one without the stars, you can see more of the detail in the tail itself. So anyways, I was just reading uh, before coming up here tonight, the guy that uh, discovered this, Terry Lovejoy, he discovered this thing with an eight inch telescope, which uh, to me is pretty impressive because with an eight inch telescope, you're not really pulling in all that much light. So anyway. Thanks. Thanks. Go back for one second here. Uh, Eric, I want you to uh, take a look at your um, one, one back, uh, I guess. I can do it. Um, Eric, this is pretty impressive. <laughs> you need to look at this. Uh, I'm sure you've looked at it a lot, but this is, uh, I think it looks nice uh, here in the, uh, in the auditorium. Uh, this is outstanding work. And uh, do, do other people agree with me that this should be submitted to Sky News? Or, 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 and this is outstanding. <laughs> this is APOC quality, I think. You know? If you put this on next year's calendar, do. Yeah. Hey, actually, Eric, that's a, an excellent idea. Um, Thank you. I'll make a note of that because I mean uh, I think that's a really really good point. I haven't seen a better photograph of Lovejoy than that. Has anyone else seen a better photograph? I haven't. Wow. And this is uh, really something to have from a <laughs> member of our uh, group, uh, Eric. This is outstanding. Thanks. It, this, it really is. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, is Tony. Tony Peterson. Thanks, Tony. Yep. I just want to amplify those comments. I was texting back and forth with Eric that night, I was worried about him, it was very cold. He had off-roaded through the snow, 
to get to one of the highest points that you could in the Madawaskan Highlands on a night when the forecast low in Ottawa was minus 25 and it was windy. So he was enduring less than minus 30 out there. His equipment was barely working. He had to connect to his mount with his Ethernet cable. Is that correct? That was the only way you could get it going? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I congratulate him just for getting home alive, let alone <laughs> getting out. I, I really think this is fantastic stuff. Okay. Have I got control? You have control. Uh, it's this one? It's this one. It's this one. That's backwards. Next one? No, no. That's oh. right. No, nope, right there one. we go. Right one. One more. Uh, okay. So first I wanted to uh, come clean about something that I missed in my presentation uh, last week, uh, particularly my image, my mosaic of uh, the Cygnus region. A couple days after that on APOD, this image uh, popped up. The Soap Bubble Nebula, which was discovered in uh, 2008, so it's not on any of my, uh, my, my charts uh, at home, my, my computer programs. Uh, and I looked at this and said, hey, this should be actually in my H-alpha mosaic. Uh, and so I went looking for it. And indeed, in the top right-hand corner, oh yeah, just pause here for a moment. This is the image I showed uh, last week. This is a 3x3 three three mosaic with uh, an 85 millimeter uh, refractor and hydrogen alpha from my backyard. And so it just coming in there from the top right. And, oh, I had to blow that up. Here. Yep, okay, right there. So it is uh, four arc minutes across and a bit, about five light years across. It was discovered in hydrogen alpha, but it's a much stronger em emitter in the O3, so it's not a very impressive image. But I just wanted to say I got it. Okay, so I'm going to do a little experiment because um, when I print uh, my photos, I realize that I have to tweak the brightness, the dynamic range, and so on to get the same result in a photograph that I think I see on my computer screen. And I would be surprised if this projector is not the same. So I'd like to know what one needs to do to an image to make it look its, its best here in the auditorium. So I'm going to show four images, three galaxies and a globular cluster. And uh, the first one is going to be the original. And then I've changed the brightness in two different ways. And so I'm just going to take a poll. Please tell me what you think looks best. So this is the original of NGC 891. And so that's with the bottom end brightened a bit. And that's with the mid-range. Should I go them again? Yes. One, okay, two, three. And I can obviously increase the effect. There's nobody so I'm resounding. The crickets are chirping. <laughs> Back to one. You like the high contrast. Okay, let's try another one. Uh, this has actually a little too high contrast. The Deerlick group and uh, Stefan's Quintet. I think that one's got to be a little better. And number one again. Really? Background's too light. Okay. Well, I did. I did. This, this is with the dark end boosted only. This is with the mid range boosted. Okay, still one, wow, okay, and then 31, okay, this is an old image. This is uh, uh, hydrogen alpha uh, boosted, uh, oh, some boosted, okay, this is a separate uh, H alpha image, a very deep one, 43 times 1,000 seconds. I subtracted the red continuum and then threw it back into the image so to bring out the, uh, the uh, H alpha uh, emitting clouds. So there's, oh. no? No. Okay, no. what about that one? No, oh, that, that, that's overblown. Okay, it might be different for a globular cluster. So here's M13. Okay, so this is a bit different than a galaxy. Yeah. There's more stars. More stars, and don't forget there's this little tiny galaxy over here. You want to be able to yeah, see that? Three, three. three for this. Yeah. Okay. So take it easy on galaxies, but pump up the stars. Okay, that's all I wanted to show. Tony, are you happy with this? And what are your thoughts? Oh well, obviously it's a huge improvement. I mean, the, what's important is that the dynamic range is much better yeah. in these images here. I mean. Sorry, what? Yeah, I forget the name of the company. It's a printing shop on the near the corner of Somerset and Bank. Right, but would you send them one, two, or three? 
Oh, I would do something very similar to two. What I discovered when I printed them is they say they've got an 8-bit printer, right? And they, they accept 8-bit images. I printed uh, 256 grayscales from pure black to white, and I looked at what you could see there, and I decided that really they're printing at about 7.6 bit. You need to compress both ends in order to get something that's got the full range from white to black. So I didn't do exactly that for any of these, but this but this is similar. I pumped up the I pumped up the, the dark end. What camera are you using? For this one, it was a Parsec 8300M, Orion, uh, yeah, which is now <clears> hors <throat> de combat. All right. Okay. That's We had a fine selection of uh, images tonight. Holy smokes! Um, all right, let's, uh, let's let's go on here and to the uh, finish up the meeting. I guess I can do it. Okay, so um, if you'd like to know more about uh, the, if, uh, the, me the meeting and uh, the various uh, members responsible for the uh, for the meeting here, I talked, for example, earlier about the uh, the. Uh, I always talk about you, Al. Uh, the um, the uh, lone librarian, the uh, telescope lone librarian, and that is, I uh, hope I'm doing the right button here. That's, uh, of course, Al. And um, as a member, you obviously get, you, you, you do get discounts on Sky and Talon Astronomy um, Magazine as well, Stephen McIntyre. If you want to get all their email addresses, it's uh, go to this, uh, to this um, URL here and, and it'll get you that information. Um, we do have a normal library, as I mentioned in previous months. Uh, that library is still at the uh, Science and Technology Museum, but I understand it's not far from being, um, it's not long before it's gonna come over to, uh, to here, so the uh, <coughs> members can continue to benefit from that. Okay, after the meeting, we, 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 um, we have a social event, which is open to all members and, and non-members alike. It's at Perkins Restaurant, which is the, uh, um, at uh, Saint Laurent and, uh, and Ogilvy. Everyone is welcome. And for uh, those of you who aren't aware, we also, you can see all the cameras here, we, we, we record this meeting and it's also being live streamed as well on, on, the, on the internet. We, we post um, the, um, the videos on, the, uh, on, on YouTube uh, and, uh, on that, and shortly after the meeting on that Ustream uh, location. So thanks. Uh, we said how many tonight here, uh, Bob? About uh, about ninety. About ninety people, which is pretty good for a February. I mean, it's usually one of our, our worst months um, in terms of attendance. But uh, I think we did very well. Thank you very much for all the, the speakers, and thank you especially for uh, for the group that helped out uh, prepare this uh, this auditorium. We had a few surprises with the auditorium, but that's another story. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we got we got through it. Um, the next meeting is, is on um, Friday, March the 6th, and I'm ex uh, same, same, same time, same location. I'm uh, excited about this meeting for a couple of reasons. One of them is um, Tim uh, Cole is back. Remember, he, did, he gave the very best, uh, the, the 2014 uh, presentation, uh, the best presentation was awarded to Tim for his uh, presentation on the astrolabes. He's back with another presentation on celestial navigation, okay? And someone I'm working on, uh, and I'm looking forward to, is uh, Dr. Haley Sabres. Uh, and she's an astrobiologist, and uh, we're bringing her to the center uh, um, for ne next month. And, I'm, um, and I think you're going to find her talk on, um, on the origins of life by looking at uh, the uh, early rock record of that of, um, on Earth and on Mars. And she's going to be exploring uh, the conceptual meaning of life and some of some even some touching on some of the philosophical definitions of what is life really when you're when you're an ex when you're a um, astrobiologist. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about her presentation. She's a very impressive uh, person, as, as you'll see, and uh, looking forward to that. I hope you can join us. So at this point, we will close the meeting, and I'm going to do the um, the, uh, the prize for the. Uh, I'm going to take draw the uh, prizes for the door, uh, draw for the door prizes, and uh, we're going to officially close the meeting. Thanks very much. And by the way, we also have a photon pump as part of the door prizes, so whatever that is. So on the internet, thanks for joining us, folks. And uh, that's it. So let me.